everyone this is update for july 24 2024 day 882 of the war and of the date update also catch up for july 23 and 22. Uh, i'm gonna start with the general strategic updates uh, and then i'm gonna switch to the situation uh, on the battlefield in ukraine so as you can see first i just want to do a little bit uh, walk through the macroeconomic data uh, mostly in the West, and, I'm, uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on with uh, Iran, Russia, uh, even Iraq, and, and, and so on. So uh, first, uh, there is a little bit of bounce, positive news uh, in the UK. Uh, manufacturing bounced uh, quite a bit up, as you can see, to 51.8 in July, and this is preliminary numbers. Uh, and also service is uh, slightly up. So just generally positive direction. Uh, I don't think there is any objective reason for this uh, positive move, as there is no re any real or meaningful changes uh, in the policy, in economic policy in the UK. So it remains to be seen if this is uh, something sustainable or this is just, uh, um, I would say, I don't have any good explanation for this bounce, let's put it this way. Uh, now let's move to uh, to the EU, uh, and uh, here uh, it picture is very, I would say, logical, where I can explain it in a very logical way. And uh, there are numbers uh, for came out for Germany, for France, and generally for EU. I didn't even include EU. It's fairly reflective of what's going on in Germany and France. Uh, but the key point is the German manufacturing uh, continuing to die. As you can see, it gets sort of uh, digs deeper down into the hole. Um, it's 42.6, quite a quite significant um, uh, reduction. Also, service uh, is uh, going in a negative direction, still um, still expanding. So that what this means, uh, just for those who are new, is um, above 50, it means expansion. Below 50 means contract, uh, contraction. So uh, the expansion is becoming, I would say, slower. That's probably we have um, uh, slower expansion. And this is negative trend overall. Um, but uh, the key point for German economy is manufacturing is clearly not service. It's manufacturing driven economy. That's where the whole value add is created in Germany. Uh, and, and this looks uh, very ugly for Germany. And, and this situation has been going on for a while there. Um, I mentioned it since last summer for sure. Um, and it's all result of uh, war on uh, conventional energy. There's not much uh, to add there. Uh, France is also doing uh, not that great. Uh, manufacturing is down as well. Similar, the similar trend in negative trend, but not as bad as in Germany. Uh, service is a little bit up, but again, uh, manufacturing is still key component in in France, uh, and uh, you know it's following the same path as Germany. But Germany is uh, undisputable leader in, I would say, destruction of its own manufacturing base. So no, things here are pretty clear. Uh, now let's move to uh, the US. Um, and uh, there is also numbers for manufacturing and service. Uh, in uh, terms of manufacturing, it's uh, went uh, into negative territory in the, uh, in the US. Uh, again, uh, this goes back to the story about some kind of manufacturing renaissance. It's simply uh, not happening. Uh, and there are structural problems in the U.S. why it's not going to happen until there are serious uh, structural changes. Uh, and they are not tariffs. Actually, uh, going back to the story of tariffs, uh, tariffs will make manufacturing even worse, uh, even more impossible uh, in the U.S. So that is actually self-destructive idea, but um, we'll... I'll, I'll talk about it sometime later uh, in terms of uh, but manufacturing is a small component of US economy because it's been dying for a long time it's like probably uh, since I think probably early 70s 
uh, manufacturing has been dying, so it shrunk to a really tiny piece of the economy in, uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, then uh, service is obviously what replaced manufacturing in um, in the U.S. And so you can see some some bounce, positive dynamic in service. But again, uh, service is not truly uh, where the value add is, is produced because most of the service is probably related to healthcare, which is net negative for the economy. No, that doesn't mean that I'm saying that people who are <laughs> sick should not be treated. That's not the case. Um, the, the right actually approach is to prevent sickness so people don't need to be sort of treated because they're healthy and that's that's really how it should be uh, but uh, if people say this is net negative it's not it's expense so that's why um, it, it's it's a big uh, problem and most of that service is not really sort of healthy growth there uh, but overall uh, you know economy is is moving along uh, in terms of that, uh, in the U.S., it started to go uh, up, as I mentioned, sometime around the um, beginning of July. Uh, it's not as fast growth as it used to be, but it's pretty consistent growth, and it's almost $35 trillion. We're almost there. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to switch a little bit to the situation um, between um, uh, Russia and Iran. So there is some uh, strategic agreement in the works about strategic cooperation between the two countries. Uh, so that will sort of uh, cement alliance between the two countries. I don't know when it's going to be officially signed, but uh, it's uh, in the works. Uh, this is uh, for those who believe that somehow <laughs> Russia will uh, change its uh, its position and decide to to be part of the West. Uh, I think that that train has gone and, and I don't think it's uh, coming back. Um, then uh, another news from uh, this called Middle East. Uh, Iraq government uh, is um, uh, requesting uh, U.S. troops, U.S. government or UN, requesting U.S. troops to leave or start a withdrawal sometime in September. Uh, and they probably looking for complete withdrawal from Iraq. What this also means is that if uh, U.S. troops uh, are gone from Iraq, then um, then Syria will be lost as well. So effectively, it's complete withdrawal from from the uh, Middle East. Uh, that will clear up sort of field for Iran to eventually um, attack. Israel in large uh, in in force let's put this way uh, so this is probably pieces of the puzzle sort of aligning slowly but surely uh, and then obviously um, the strategic alliance strategic agreement between uh, Russia and Iran will will support that uh, there is also now railroad link between the three countries so they are no longer dependent on the um, uh, on the sea so if there is any kind of uh, uh, naval blockade of, of China Iran and uh, Russia uh, they can simply use uh, land uh, connection railroad to continue transportation of whatever they need to 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 uh, to exchange with um, so they there is very clear strategic thinking uh, about the potential uh, future conflict and how to uh, protect basically exchange of the goods and everything and protect ec economic activity in all three countries and now all three countries are connected uh, through railroad network and, and obviously that makes it uh, harder to disrupt simply because um, even at you know you can always attack railroad uh, lines but it, they are very easy or relatively easy and quick uh, to rebuild so they could be easily repaired and put back in in service within less than a day half a day and so on so uh, this is going to be uh, very difficult to disrupt generally speaking um, now a little bit about uh, what's going on with ukraine so ukraine uh, 
Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, went uh, to China uh, and from my perspective received pretty um, uh, cold treatment there uh, because China essentially said okay the time for the for the peace agreement is not ready uh, let's just fight for a little bit longer uh, and this is actually I think will be surprised eventually uh, for the Western leaders you know, when they realize that actually uh, Russia and, and China they don't want any peace so once Ukraine is Ukraine is already indicating we, we, we're willing to negotiate uh, and effectively China and Russia politely saying well no we'll, we'll do it later once things will really get desperate for you uh, but the, re the real point is uh, is Russia wants uh, complete capitulation of Ukraine uh, that's where it's all going and I think uh, this will be quite a bit of a shock uh, for Ukrainian political top once they realize that that's really where the Russia is heading where everything is heading uh, and um, th that's as I stated that's going to be quite a bit of shock not only for Ukraine but I think for the West uh, because right now Russia is really uh, skillfully um, pushing narrative that uh, they they want peace it's just Ukraine doesn't want peace and, and West doesn't want a peace and that's a whole story that's being pushed um, but in reality uh, this Russia does not want does not want peace because uh, it wants uh, the whole of Ukraine and and so this was just sort of like a play or I don't know facade uh, for everyone uh, to pretend that Russia is looking for some kind of peace now uh, which is um, uh, let's say Russia is wants peace but on its own terms which really means lifting all of the sanctions and allowing to to basically control Ukraine fully uh, and um, no <laughs> no NATO or no EU for Ukraine uh, and effectively either puppet government or comp or basically annexation of Ukraine uh, and that's with Russia's vision uh, for Ukraine uh, now let's uh, switch to the situation on the battlefield and I'm gonna do a quick walkthrough in a clockwise fashion the way I always do so first start uh, I'm gonna start with the situation along the state border all the way up to Kharkiv uh, things remain more or less the same nothing uh, nothing of importance there Let's jump to um, to Kharkiv. So here, there's um, back and forth going on. Uh, Russian um, troops uh, counterattacked and uh, managed to squeeze uh, Ukrainian troops from the book. Not completely, but uh, they control majority of the village. Uh, it's nothing of sort of consequence. Nothing truly earth shaking. It's just. Uh, uh, sort of local uh, counter-attack, uh, I would say inconsequential from a big picture uh, perspective. Uh, also, uh, there's a little bit more clarity in terms of actual Russian troops. So it looks like uh, Russian command brought here 155th. Uh, they call Naval Infantry Brigade, but it actually uh, should be Naval uh, Infantry Division. Uh, so unclear if this is already... Uh, was converted to division or it's still uh, uh, functioning as brigade uh, technically it should be actually uh, should be division uh, now let's move to the situation on the uh, Luhansk front line North Luhansk uh, Russian troops continue to push everywhere they uh, have small gains here and there pretty much everywhere around the uh, front line, uh, especially in this direction towards Kupiansk, uh, that's where the majority of the gains are happening. Uh, it's much more stable in the southern uh, uh, sector of this front line, uh, but overall, uh, Ukrainian uh, troops are clearly on retreat and barely holding uh, the the. Uh, the front line from completely cracking. So I'm not saying that they're, they they holding the the positions, but they retreat slowly, uh, and uh, the Russian pressure is strong enough uh, that uh, 
ability of Ukrainian forces to hold and, and to retreat slowly but surely in orderly fashion uh, will be quite a bit tested here pretty soon because um, it's already uh, quite a bit of tested in the central and bus front line and I'll, I'll talk about it once I get there so now let's uh, discuss a uh, north um, the Donbass front line uh, here uh, pressure in the northern sector remains uh, strong slowly uh, but surely losing also uh, some ground especially in the area between Vemka to uh, Spirne um, uh, but here situation much more stable I would say more stable than uh, in most other uh, locations so the front line where there is Russian pressure uh, here uh, now let's look at the situation around the CVR uh, Russian troops uh, 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 shifted a little bit attacks towards Rehorivka uh, because they starting to realize that they actually need before they really make can make decisive move um, to uh, capture the CVR they really need to have uh, wider um, uh, I would say launching pad, uh, and so they need uh, they need Rehorivka. So the focus a little bit sh uh, shifted. They uh, they attacking Rehorivka so that then they can basically attack from Rehorivka in the, sort of creates uh, one part of the pincer, and then the other one is gonna come from the south. So uh, still sort of building. Um, the whole structure to to capture the CVR here. Uh, now let's move to the central and bus front line where things are really, I would say, terrible um, uh, for Ukraine. And this is where um, um, I mentioned that uh, Ukrainian troops are, I would say, really uh, on the verge of, in some areas, in some spots, on the verge of disorganized retreat, and, and sometimes it does happen, and that's how really this progress was uh, captured by Russian troops, and it, it appears that similar situation is developing around Volche, uh, so that Volche is going to be uh, probably lost uh, in a uh, quick fashion. Uh, also, uh, Russian troops starting attacks uh, towards Timofeevka, so again, uh, situation here is uh, is completely not stable. Let's put it this way, uh, partially uh, because some of the units simply don't hold uh, the line, and, and you cannot blame them because uh, this uh, sometimes is no support, terrible commanders, and it just essentially uh, soldiers are required to be uh, kamikaze, and, and nobody wants to be that. Uh, so. Uh, things probably going to get much worse here, uh, and that's probably part of the reason why um, uh, Ukrainian Minister of Foreign Affairs went to China, signaling that Ukraine is um, uh, willing to negotiate because situation here is uh, can quickly turn into really uh, quite disastrous um, uh, development where Russian um, troops will really breach the front line in the meaningful. Uh, a way where how the offensive should be not just squeezes like right now uh, but uh, in 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 true offensive way where they can start moving in masses uh, into Ukrainian rear and it's gonna simply collapse the front line in this area uh, and lead to quite a bit of collapse um, Russian troops um, close to be done uh, capturing uh, Novoselov Kapersha here so uh, again, the focus will be continuing uh, this move between these, call it, gates. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, the situation around Krasnohorivka also uh, pretty, uh, pretty negative for Ukrainian forces. Uh, they, uh, again, losing position in this uh, northwestern uh, part of it, and uh, the, the, the control shrinks. Uh, still controlling something, but uh, it's it's close to be lost. Let's put it this way. Uh, Russian troops also managed to advance um, west of Marinka. Uh, so um, again, as you can see, the front line is really not holding on. 
um, there is something that was quite remarkable uh, that happened uh, in the section of the 79th uh, Brigade. Russian command actually started attacking uh, in a true, um, I would say, World War II type of formations. Uh, not quite as huge as they could be, but at least uh, it, it's it's getting there. So there was an uh, attack with, I think, 11 tanks and things like 45 uh, a uh, AFEs, so BMP, uh, 1, 2, 3, basically. Um, and um, they managed to so this is uh, you know going back why it's important because uh it's a it's how uh, warfare was done during world war ii uh, where there was a huge masses of uh, armored equipment that was you know ramming essentially front lines through front line uh, it's still not completely perfect how it's being done, but it's clearly that Russian command is uh, learning how to um, uh, use uh, large-scale uh, forces or units uh, in 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 offensive <coughs> fashion. So this will eventually will will turn uh, from quantity; it will turn into quality eventually. Uh, and it's it's there is quite noticeable progress basically uh, on the Russian side uh, in this respect. Uh, so they managed to uh, to advance some. Um, they they were stalled because they uh, they lost I think six tanks out of uh, eleven, and that was uh, uh, you know significant sort of how to say. Um, Forced them to to basically stop advance, but they did advance, uh, and uh, the losses uh, among AFEs were fairly uh, fairly small. Only seven, I think, uh, out of forty five. So uh, that is uh, sort of somewhat manageable. Again, um, it wasn't sort of true success uh, for Russian troops, but it was you know it wasn't actually first attempt. It, it actually uh, Russian command already uh, attempted this approaches, um, but uh, it's clearly uh, moving in a negative direction for Ukrainian side because uh, Ukrainian forces are simply um, not going to be able to withstand such a um, huge masses of uh, of troops. Uh, the lucky part was that 79th Brigade is, uh, I would say, high-quality brigade, so it was able to withstand the, the hit. But if it were something like low-quality, uh, there will be quite a bit of a uh, hole in Ukrainian defenses. Um, so, uh, again, another negative sign on strategic level as well. Uh, where it's very clear that uh, Ukrainian forces are losing in st terms of strategic development in general, in development, uh, organizational development uh, relative to Russian forces. Um, now let's look at the situation on the Zaporizhia front line. Things here are more or less stable. Some Russian pressure uh, north of uh, Orozhina, basically they continue pressuring towards Veliko Novosilka. But nothing major going on here. It's very clear that uh, that resources are being pulled from this area, uh, and the same is true from the front line along the Dnipro River. Russian resources, also minimal resources here. Most of it is uh, apparently pulled in that area, uh, central Donbas front line that we, I just discussed. But otherwise, here everything is uh, fairly quiet. That's it for the day. Thanks for watching. Till next time. Bye-bye.